welcome to today's lecture. So, we continue our discussion on the on a bit of a fundamentals the principles of Raman scattering and then the way the, the as much of principle that we must uh, have some idea. So, that we understand the thing better and so that we utilize the data or we know when we are generating the data what exactly we are doing. So, coming back or continuing with the last uh, discussion that we have considering simple molecules like water which is a nonlinear molecule, there we can have 3 may 3 n minus 6 normal modes or if we go to molecules which are nonlinear which we will see later, it will be 3 n minus 5 means number of suppose for example, it is a carbon dioxide there are 3 atoms. So, carbon dioxide will have 4 uh, normal modes or the fundamental vibrational modes. And uh, see so incident electromagnetic radiation is responsible in inducing an instantaneous dipole moment which is always represented by mu and by deforming the electron cloud around the molecule. So, if the displacement of the electron cloud corresponds to that of a vibrational mode then the mode will be Raman active. So, just to have this uh, uh, corresponding diagram here which is uh, taken from the fundamental textbooks which I mentioned before. This water molecules three different vibrational states can be explained with this diagram. If this is our normal molecule of water, then when we are uh, in the corresponding to nu 1 that is symmetric stretching. So, the stretching could be either in a positive direction or negative direction means this ellipse is either contracting or expanding here, but they would correspond to the same and this same molecule of water is actually undergoing symmetric stretching uh, either compression or extension. Now, in contrast to that situation corresponding to nu 2 the original molecule here is actually getting distorted to either a prolate or an oblate depending on the stretching or uh, the, uh, the asymmetrical stretching of these two uh, of these bonds. Similarly, the third case is bending mode this is a bending mode and uh, this here we see that this ellipse is distorted and uh, this also in two different uh, situations possible. So, this give us a graphical idea about what exactly happening during the symmetric or asymmetric stretching and bending of the molecules. So, now we have to understand that why in uh, some of the fundamental modes vibrational modes are Raman active and some are not. So, with respect to that same water molecule here for what we sorry this has been this is in uh, relation to a carbon dioxide molecule. Here it is n is 3 and uh, so it is will be 3 n minus 5 that is 4 fundamental modes of vibration. So, here this is a carbon dioxide molecule it is now it is a linear molecule it is now also undergoing symmetric stretching. So, here what we observe in the symmetric stretching can be represented by this displacement uh, which is represented by j here either in a positive positive saying is compression or is extension and the what happens to the polarizability that is alpha as this uh, stretching is taking place which is represented by this uh, uh, coordinate. So, what happens is that when alpha, when the value of alpha uh, when this uh, displacement is 0 exactly. So, at that point of time the slope of d alpha by d j is not equal to 0 as you can see from this tangent which is drawn here. So, it is a symmetric stretching situation and then in the rest of the other cases where uh, it is a case of uh, bending it could be bent uh, in either of the ways as shown by this uh, ellipse here. So, in the bending case the when the displacement is 0 there we find that is d alpha by d j is, a, is 0 in both the cases that is, that is corresponding to sigma nu 2 and nu 4 and this representing nu 3. So, these uh, kind of uh, idea or this kind of little bit of a fundamental without getting into any much of details of the physics of it. We now know that considering simple molecules like water, carbon dioxide or methane when we were going to take their uh, Raman uh, their Raman spectra. So, they can that is at the back of our mind that we know that how many fundamental modes of vibration are going to be Raman active and can expect uh, the Raman peaks on those kind of uh, situations. And uh, although it is not uh, um, covered uh, in this, 
this uh, IR spectra are also they also work in this particular uh, wavelength region and there is a convention that those bands which are essentially IR inactive they may be uh, they may Raman inactive they may be IR active and they can be studied in an IR uh, infrared uh, spectrometry uh, which uh, we might may, may be discuss a little bit in brief. So, Raman spectroscope uh, laser Raman microspectrometry and uh, the uh, infrared spectrometry which is essentially done with a Fourier transform uh, infrared that is FTIR. They basically these methods are employed as non destructive in situ analysis of the gaseous species in a molecular species or other I would say in the inclusion fluid and uh, uh, they work in the same principle. So, now uh, let us try to uh, look at a little bit simplistically as to what will happen. So, as from the form from the standard relationship we know that if there is any scattering there will be major part of the light will be elastically scattered and a very negligible part of it will be inelastically scattered either with loss or gain in the energy of the emitted light. So, uh, here in this case we represent the incident photon with nu 0 and that interacts with the vibrating molecule. So, in this case the incident photon nu 0 is annihilated and a new photon with a lower frequency of nu r is uh, then the incident photon is created. So, it is a less in its energy than the uh, incident photon and the molecule undergoes a Raman active vibrational transition that is nu r to a higher energy level. Alternatively in this diagram when there is a uh, gain then the in then the electromagnetic energy gains the energy and is emitted with a higher frequency. So, that we say in this in this case we say Stokes and the other re reverse case we case uh, we say anti Stokes which is also shown by this energy level diagram. And uh, so, this is the Rayleigh scattering where we see that there is no change that is del E i is h nu 0 del E that is incident and emitted that is also h nu 0 this is also h nu 0 and there is no uh, loss or gain in the energy and this is the Rayleigh scattering. And in this case del E i <coughs> is h nu 0 where del E e that is your that is emitted the change in the energy of the emitted is minus h into nu 0 minus nu v this is the stroke scattering and here it is nu 0 plus nu v. This is how we can uh, understand the process of the inelastic scattering resulting in either a Stokes scattering or an anti Stokes scattering. In the Stokes scattering the emitted uh, electromagnetic wave has a higher as a lower frequency and lower energy corresponding to the incident uh, uh, wave and uh, so here the energy the excess energy is given off to the vibrating molecule which now vibrates with a higher frequency. And the reverse is true uh, where the uh, bond is already vibrating at an excited state and it gives off the energy to the incident electromagnetic energy and which is emitted with a higher frequency and higher energy. Possibly this uh, is the way very simplistic way of understanding it. Now then when we are considering any particular molecule. Uh, which is uh, say for example, at a particular state at a room temperature. So, how many of such uh, the, what the, the, the scattering that is taking place what will be the percentage of it which will be uh, scattered by Stokes scattering or the one which will be scattered by anti Stokes will be depending on the it is basic, basically statistics uh, statistically speaking how many bonds will be actually vibrating in their normal ground state or how many bonds will be vibrating in their excited state. Keeping many things many other parameters uh, not considering them at least we can expect that if the temperature is higher then the possible the probability of more bonds vibrating with their uh, with, an, uh, with an excited state will be more compared to what we get in a lower temperature. So, in a in a typically in a Raman spectroscopy uh, we should be seeing at both the strokes and anti strokes scattering, but for 
most of our practical purpose when we do fluid inclusion analysis and we are interested in knowing the detecting the presence of various molecular species only the Stokes part uh, which is essentially statistically much more significant suffices our purpose. So, this gives a uh, rough idea as to what I exactly just said. So, what happens is that this is kind of a rough sketch of scattering in general. Now, on a uh, you can say the x axis is corresponding to uh, frequency the energy which is now converted in terms of or which is essentially the relative uh, scale with respect to the frequency or the energy of the incident electromagnetic wave. So, if we take the difference so the center will be 0 and then here on this side it is positive that means, how much of energy is actually lost. So, where it is E minus E that is how much of energy is lost by the uh, incident electromagnetic energy in uh, undergoing the Stokes uh, scattering and here it is the anti Stokes scattering and it is very symmetrical means now here we are plotting this or we are getting the spectra plotting the spectra on a scale where we say that it is something called a Raman shift. So, shift will always be relative relative to the energy of the incident uh, electromagnetic wave and so as we see here the Stokes uh, side is shown by a peak which is uh, higher in its uh, amplitude it is a more intense peak corresponding to what we get in an anti Stokes and that is what happens in most of the cases. Uh, so, if we want to study so, if you take a molecule in that molecule there are say m number of Raman active modes. So, if there are m number of Raman active modes this m number of Raman active modes will undergo Stokes scattering at corresponding to different value of the difference in their energy that means the Raman shift which will be represented as more than one number of peak on a on something which we will call as a spectro as a spectra the spectrum. Uh, many of the, the uh, just to uh, keep this idea that whenever we are able to uh, represent the this um, the, uh, the result of the the an interaction of the electromagnetic uh, energy with the bonds and we are able to represent them in terms of intensity versus uh, a frequency in terms of the difference. So, we will call it as a spectrometry because there is uh, enough of scope that we could also do some semi quantitative uh, measurements analysis of these species. And then in uh, in most of the cases we by our optical uh, device that we are using it may be possible uh, to only observe the Stokes side of the spectrum, but most of the material science and uh, most of the applications the both Stokes and anti Stokes are studied, but for our purpose uh, the Stokes side of the spectrum is uh, quite sufficient for us. So, here it is an example that it actually ok. So, before uh, before we go to the uh, this thing this uh, discussions it is also essential to know that when we are, we are uh, attempting to understand this process the principles of Raman scattering by using an electromagnetic energy and its interaction with the vibrating molecular vibrating bonds in the molecule it has to be a single wavelength uh, light. So, we use a uh, monochromatic light as we uh, discussed we if you use a argon ion uh, laser generally which are available as uh, either a 520 nanometer within the visible uh, part of the spectrum which can see them as green color or we can use uh, a uh, solid state laser which where the laser light is emitted at a wavelength of 785 nanometer. We will discuss about which wavelength to choose later on, but this is an example that <coughs> normally the shorter wavelength uh, the higher frequency the shorter wavelength uh, laser is of higher energy excitation energy as you can see the green is actually for the green argon ion laser 514 nanometer and uh, this is the Stokes and anti Stokes which is shown which is with a minus uh, delta sigma and plus delta sigma and here it is a the case of a 
785 nanometer di diode laser whose energy is much less. We will uh, discuss as to which laser to choose for our application later on. This is an example of a Raman spectrum of sulphur where we could see that both strokes and anti strokes are shown and uh, characteristically you could see that they are very symmetrically uh, placed at 218 minus 218, 153 minus 153, 472, 4, minus 472 and 472 and here what is basically presented here is the uh, Raman shift means the change or the difference in the frequency of the incident laser with the emitted uh, with the frequency of the emitted light and here intensity or could be in arbitrary unit and uh, just to give you a because these days the instrumentations are very much uh, being improved being modified <coughs> every uh, very periodically and uh, in very short uh, frequencies of time. So, I am just giving you a very rough idea about how a uh, Raman spectrometer is basically the components are designed. So, this is a laser source it is a continuous uh, laser source it uh, because we are interested in studying the uh, interaction in a uh, in a um, kind of a time span. So, it has to and also uh, I will just I will just discuss it. So, this is the laser source the laser source is uh, getting guided through series of lenses and mirrors through which the laser light is actually getting incident through the objective on the sample. So, here is basically the when we say it is my laser micro uh, Raman microspectrometry we are using a microscope. So, the laser spectrometer the Raman spectrometer is coupled to a microscope and essentially we can represent that this through the microscope objective which be a high power objective through which the laser spot is made to be incident or focused on the sample. So, here our sample is a wafer in which inclusions are there and we need to focus the laser light which will be uh, of the size of or the order of a 1 micron in its diameter and the diameter could possibly be varied, but normally uh, when we try to um, uh, study an inclusion which will be about a couple of tens of microns or even less than that in its maximum dimension and sometimes we will be needing to focus on a part of the inclusion to know the characteristic there or what is the gas there. So, this particular laser light has to be focused on the sample it is not only the sample since inclusions will be placed below the surface of the sample. So, we will have to be have to focus on deeper uh, on them on planes which are below the surface and once we focus them the, the, the device is so uh, designed that wherever we get the optical focus to look at the inclusion the laser also will be focused there. Means say for example, we just want to focus the laser light about 5 micron below the surface where an inclusion is placed we can exactly focus the laser light exact on the inclusion itself. If the laser is not been able to focus on the inclusion then we are not we cannot expect a good signal or a good spectra uh, to be obtained. At the same time since this inelastic scattering is also very weak scattering we can also we also need to be uh, cautious about the depth at which we would like to get the information. An inclusion which is below the depth of about 550 microns or so from the surface generally by the time the inelastically scattered Raman uh, scattering is coming from the material it is actually get getting attenuated or absorbed by the through the thickness of the wafer that is coming and the experience says that inclusions which are placed from surface to within at least about 50 micron depth they, their Raman signal could be very effectively collected. So, here the optics works like this it is a 180 degree scatter the laser light laser is focused on the sample and the scattered Raman signal is also collected through the same objective and is uh, guided through to the detector. Now, what happens here is that the devices the, op, the, op, the spectrometer is so designed as we know that the major part of the uh, scattered light is elastically scattered. So, that elastically scattered part of the light corresponding to this particular which would be a much much more stronger uh, in the in its intensity compared to the inelastically scattered part of the light. So, this spectrometer 
there should be some kind of filtering mechanism which should be there so that the Rayleigh scattered wave uh, Rayleigh scattered light will has to be absorbed or cut off by this particular filter has to be filtered out by the cut off and only the inelastically scattered part of the light will be able to pass through and through a series of uh, optical devices like a slit and again which will be uh, made to be fall on the surface of a prism on the, the parallel light and then this uh, this light which is the Raman scattered uh, the inelastically scattered light which is coming through this will be coming through all its wavelengths ranges and the only the ones which will be having the uh, we want the, 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 the frequency or the, the Raman shift part of it is of our interest we need to only determine that and whenever there is and the component the that part which, which is coming out of because of a strokes or a stroke scattering at any different uh, corresponding to a different discrete uh, values of the Raman shift we will be able to get them by using a grating which is actually is something which is being used for dispersing this inelastically scattered light into its constituent uh, wavelength or frequency. So, by using that device we can again by so it if this device uh, this grating which is rote which made to be rotate through a uh, angular uh, value even up to even can maximum up to rotate up to 180. So, depending on that the position of the particular grating will allow only that particular frequency uh, electromagnetic wave to pass through and again fall on the detector. So, the basic units of this elect this Raman uh, spectrometer which is a laser Raman spectrometer is the source laser source which could be a arganion laser or a solid state laser or maybe some uh, better developed things of the right at this moment and has to be uh, guided through the optics the incident on the microscope on through the microscope objective on the sample must have a device to filter out the relay and then have a device over here because we are doing it only in the uh, in a normal uh, frequency mode. So, here it has to be a grating which will disperse the uh, the emitted or the emitted inelastically scattered light and the that light will fall on the detector and the detector will sense based on the intensity of the particular light corresponding to that particular frequency. So, the advantage of the Raman spectroscopy Raman spectrometry rather I would say that it depends dependent on short range ordering. So, our amorphous materials can also be characterized this is minimal minimum sample preparation required Raman, Raman spectroscopy does not require any elaborate sample preparation the same wafer which we are using for our microthermometric study can be used for the uh, Raman spectrometric study and when it if the material is something different it could be powder it could be solid or thin polish sections liquid chamber we can or a gas can be can be easily uh, be used for studying Raman spectroscopy. So, one which is very important aspect of Raman spectrometry is that the Raman spectra if we uh, see the fundamental uh, literature on Raman spectrometry it tells us that Raman spectra is the fingerprint of the chemical compounds and has a minimal overlap or interferences on the matrix effect. So, if we if we have characterized I mean if, if that is why we generally able to identify if we get a peak at a particular position and we know that it is because of that particular molecule. So, it is basically uh, it, there is no uh, scope of any confusion or any uh, overlap and from the occurrence of that of course, we will be discussing a little bit where where this could be violated and it is very fast acquisition when the uh, when we use such equipment we can just take the spectra for a few seconds and the uh, if the instrumental uh, parameters are all are working fine then we will we get a very uh, acceptable and very good quality spectra. So, here the limitation as far as the fluid inclusion studies are concerned that it is only that the ionically bonded molecules can be characterized the sorry ionically bonded molecules cannot be characterized this only we are will be analyzing the ones which are the 
uh, molecules which are bonded by covalent bonds. Uh, the molecules which are of our interest water, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen, argon. Now, the thing is that so that means it essentially would rule out to uh, analyze any of the dissolved aqueous species in the liquid part of the fluid inclusion. But then these uh, kind of things are also being now uh, worked upon and there are many improved methods of studying Roman spectroscopy one of uh, which basically is now is known as the cryo Raman spectroscopy or spectrometry in which if we have an inclusion and this inclusion we know that uh, when it is frozen to conditions corresponding to its uh, ternary eutectic or burn by or the depending on the fluid mixture it is. So, in a completely frozen state it is forming the solids like like an ice or now say for example, we what we cannot analyze normally as per this limitation is that how much of sodium, how much of uh, potassium or calcium is there in that aqueous part of the liquid. But then if some such uh, dissolved species are going to form their hydrates say for example, NaCl 2 H 2 is a hydrohalide or CaCl 2 6 H 2 O is an antarcticide and there are many such uh, mineral species whose uh, many such aqueous species which, who form their respective hydrates these can be characterized by the they, they, these have their corresponding uh, Raman uh, characteristics which can be identified from the uh, Raman peak for because the moment there is a water molecule coming to the attached to that uh, solid there will be OH bending space stretching characteristic and associated with that characteristic uh, uh, vibration uh, modes of the molecule. Uh, this way are not uh, elaborating in detail they can be pursued uh, for anybody who is interested in this. And uh, so, uh, how we actually then uh, in a we get the Raman spectra when we have some molecules we put the laser beam on it and then acquire the uh, spectra that is from the inelastically scattered part of the light. Uh, so, how we use them? So, definitely we need to have some standard or well, some well characterized material or some known value for their occurrence of these uh, peaks corresponding to the Raman shifts and will be essentially based on those uh, modes or those uh, fundamental vibration modes which are Raman active. So, some such I have just uh, listed here from standard literature uh, you can see the whole list of such gases, solids, hydrates and so on and their corresponding uh, Raman shift these are actually corresponding to the Raman shift uh, exactly the way we have put here putting 0 over here and since we know that we are not interested in the uh, anti Stokes part of it we can we say that okay, we basically could start from start from somewhere as 0 and go to the higher Raman shift can go to anything 5000, 6000, 7000 uh, centimeter inverse in terms of the frequency difference with the incident uh, electromagnetic energy. So, this is carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is characterized by uh, its uh, new one we, because we said that there is the, uh, the same symmetric stretching new one which is Raman active and uh, the other three are not Raman active. But sometimes there are certain things which come up as uh, some other kind of phenomena that takes place which uh, are kind of overtones or some kind of uh, resonance things which take place which we are not discussing in details here. So, for example, carbon dioxide will be very very well characterized by a peak occurring at uh, say this is for example, 0. So, a corresponding to 1285 and 1388 centimeter inverse. So, this is very so whenever we uh, we are putting the laser beam on the part. So, uh, we also must keep in mind that 
when we are doing Raman spectroscopy, we are not uh, taking the bulk inclusion characteristics. It is only uh, focusing the uh, laser beam on the part which was sometimes will be suppose uh, this is an this is an inclusion and aqueous carbonic inclusion and this is the liquid carbonic part. and this is the aqueous liquid and this is may or may not have a carbonic vapor. So, we would be interested in characterizing only the carbonic part of it. So, we will put the laser spot on the carbonic part and the spectra that we will get will correspond to that only that particular part on which we have focused the laser. So, it is it is does not uh, take the whole inclusion content uh, it does not give the idea about what is the composition of the whole uh, content of the whole inclusion. Uh, sometime we may be interested in just uh, getting it getting the vapor bubble and see what is its composition or uh, sometimes we may see there is some solid in it and try to find out what is the uh, composition of that particular solid or if it is uh, if it happens to be a um, uh, molecule that can be characterized by Raman spectroscopy then we can put the beam on there. So, uh, so now with that So, similarly there is there is the, the position peak position of methane, the ni nitrogen, water, H 2 S, graphite these are all they definitely. So, these things have been studied with the Raman spectroscopy in the laboratory and uh, confirmed as almost like as if in, say in case of a in, uh, reference material that we study uh, in our other analytical uh, methods. So, these uh, Raman uh, the peak positions in the Raman uh, spectra are prior are known before beforehand and only thing is that whenever we try to characterize something which is a mixture. So, here are some examples you could uh, see here. Uh, these are some of the vapor carbonic inclusions um, occurring in the migmatites in eastern Hart's mobile belt and uh, the spectra is shown here in B where you could see that these are the carbon dioxide 2 peaks. So, here we are going from uh, 0 to 3000 in this uh, range and here this corresponds to the 1285 peak and this corresponds to the 1388 peak of carbon dioxide. So, when we get a, spe get a spectrum like this, so there is possibly no much of uh, suspicion or no doubts as to whether what it could be. So, we know the peak is coming at 1388, we know its spectrum of carbon dioxide and you could see a small peak of uh, methane somewhere here. And then uh, this is a uh, this is an inclusion where it is a graphite bearing inclusion and the laser beam being put on the liquid part of it, it gives carbon dioxide a little bit of methane it is purely carbon dioxide. And when the laser beam is put on this black part which is graphite you get a spectra like this. Sometimes if you put somewhere little bit uh, in between or on the boundary of the fiber fibers of graphite over here and the liquid you get the spectra for the two carbon dioxide peak here and the graphite. So, graphite is also well uh, known where the graphite peaks will come. Uh, one is coming at around uh, 1350, the other one is about uh, 1580 and the other one is 2700. So, this, uh, these are so one has to go through the standard literature and the updated information about the, spec, the Raman spectral characteristics of uh, different types of gaseous species and their and the different solid species. So, that any unknown uh, sample when we are taking our fluid inclusions we subject it to Raman spectroscopy uh, study using a laser Raman microspectrometer we know what we got. So, this is also an, an another example from uh, the auriferous cyst belt of Dharwar Kratom where you see a very clear cut graphite bearing inclusion you put the laser beam. So, these are this is 20 microns. So, even the graphite bearing part a 1 micron laser beam could be put here and you see the 3 graphite peaks put on the liquid part we are seeing carbon dioxide and methane. So, the as compared to the previous case what uh, we saw so this proportion of the me, me peak of the methane is uh, more. So, it exactly goes very qualitatively that way that means, the material corresponding to this particular inclusion that is being analyzed here definitely has a much more proportion of methane and uh, whether it is exactly that or something also has to be considered in addition to that we will discuss. Uh, 
Okay, so, we will uh, continue our discussion on the application of uh, Raman spectroscopy to fluid inclusions and uh, how to utilize the data, what interpretations we can make uh, in the next class. Thank you.